D, it's almost footy season, right? Oh, yes. I can and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm sure you are. And I know our guest with us is ready for footy season. But Liam Pickering, welcome to the Dawson D Show. Good to be here, boys. It's uh, Yeah, it's an interesting little setup you've got here. <laughs> no, thank you. Is that good or bad? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, good. <laughs> it's good. It's tucked away. It was hard work in the park. <laughs> it's not quite that. SDN, though, is it? Um, but... Well, because as Doss said, we're so excited for the footy season. I'm sure we're going to chat a bit about footy shortly, but we've been listening to you over the summer and uh, your passion with cricket. But also, can you just relay a bit of a story you told us off air about a, a certain chair going down <laughs> oh, recently yeah. at, <laughs> at Nessie? <laughs> Straight to it, dude. <laughs> yes, well, you didn't muck around, but uh, yeah, we were broadcasting from the St Kilda Sea Bars doing one of our shows, the Ride for Sick Kids for McDonald's and uh, on McDonald's, uh, Ronald McDonald House. And yeah, we were there and Hutchie and I were sitting under a tent and a lot of people were... Sort of confusing us for the people that were taking registrations for the riding that was going on on the, <laughs> the spin so, spin uh, classes. And then, yeah, a lot of people around. And then next thing, uh, Hutchie was about to throw to a break and the big man went down. <laughs> he went down hard too. <laughs> he was splayed. Now, I, I have to admit, I, I, I didn't really help him that much. I laughed too much. But <laughs> the big guy went down. He took it on face value. We have played it a lot on SEM, but... Yeah, you know, he just copped it, I guess, and moved on. But what else could he do? There's that many people around. I was laughing at the top of my voice. How did he not laugh? I mean, your best one of your close mates just falls down off a t- oh, that happened to us actually, a former guest. And, and he actually fell down um, as we we're walking out of the out of our studio and you couldn't help but laugh. It was unfortunately one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> well, I, we all laugh at other people's misfortune. And, and Hutchie, unfortunately, it wasn't that he slipped off the chair. The chair just had enough. He <laughs> just gave up. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we're going to hear a few Hutchie stories as we go on uh, this, as we go on throughout the episode. But it's not about Hutchie; it's about you. Um, tell us at the moment what you're up to this time of year, like your involvement with with AFL and players and, and management. Where do you kind of sit going into 2024? Yeah, well, I had a good break over Christmas, so that's always a quiet time. Obviously, everyone gets away, but getting back into it now. So cricket's finished. So I do a bit of stuff with SEN with the cricket, and we manage some cricketers as well. And then uh, practice matches start. Sunday, mm. really. So mm. they're, they're just on our doorstep. So they'll start the commentary. I think my first couple of games are in the, uh, I think they're the two at Icon Park. It might be Collingwood, Richmond, and then Carlton, Melbourne, like on a Tuesday, Wednesday night or a Monday, Tuesday night. Um, and then, really, from that, we're into it. So, mm. and from a day to day stuff, like we're doing, like the players out of contract at the moment, we're recruiting new players, um, all that sort of stuff. So it sort of keeps us busy on, you know, whether it's cricket or footy, we're doing that sort of day in, day out. You were saying off air that SEM bought your company out. How long ago was that? Uh, four and a half years ago, yeah, it was, yeah, they decided that SEN is an acquisition business, you know, obviously we've got yeah. radio and TV yep. and teams, you know, Perth Wildcat and these sort of uh, teams, but, and we've just got the new licence for the Melbourne Ma- Melbourne Mavericks in the netball, yep. so, and a number of other teams, but part of that build was to, they thought was a good fit, was a, a management business, yeah. uh, sports management, they're in sports, man- sports themselves, so, which is fine, um, so from that perspective, they came to us and said, we'd like to do it with you. We were already sharing an office with them. We were already working out of SCN. Um, initially, James Pitcher and I, who who's my, you know, was my partner in uh, in Precision, our old management company, and we sort of didn't really want to do it. We were, we were happy doing our own stuff. But then with all the assets that SCN have got uh, and, the, and the broader business, SCG, um, we just thought it was a great fit. So, mm. yeah, we sold our business four and a half years ago. So we work for the man now, the big man. Yeah, the big man. <laughs> the big man. Um, tell us about – or to bring the listeners up to speed a little bit, tell us a bit about your journey coming out of out of footy and, and your career up until this point. Uh, well, post-footy career, yeah. I sort of was doing a little bit of stuff with – because we always worked when we were playing. So mm. I was – when I was playing footy at North and then, written it, and then Geelong, uh, it was – the ANZ Bank for five years and I was a sales rep selling carpets, if you can believe it, for wow. eight years, <laughs> wholesale carpets. And then I worked at a company called Feeler, which you'd know, like yep. a sporting brand, Italian sporting brand. We, I did that for a couple of years and when I retired in 2000, I, I can, progressed into that and I was doing some coaching out at the Western Jets. And then Chris Giannopoulos, who heads up Bravo now, who we worked together, he employed me back in 2001, got me to go into management at IMG back in the day. So that's wow. how I sort of got going. Um, and then from there, it sort of progressed to where we are today. In terms of managing, what is – I don't know, the listeners will be intrigued. What is managing? So you hear talent management all the time and if it's sport or entertainment, when it comes to talent, what is managing? Well, managing, uh, it could be any one of any, a million things really. I mean, some client, all clients are different. So some clients need day-to-day discussions and chat, catch-ups and chats and whatever. And the predominantly why you get a manager in, in our industry is – to negotiate your contract and to find your endorsement deals. That's in a broad nutshell. Cash, in a, cash. In a nutshell. <laughs> Make me money. <laughs> yeah, Make cash. me money because that's what they're paying me yeah. to do. Um, so that's 
in a nutshell, that's what it is. But it's a whole lot more than that because you're getting young players at, you know, we're signing kids at 17, 18, um, in footy, cricket, netball, basketball, you name it. Um, and you've got to take them on the journey. So you go on the journey with them and, and their families, especially when they're young. So it's educating them about, you know, off-field stuff and, you know, work, helping them, you know, with anything you can do really to set them up off the field. There's, there's no financial benefit in it for us, but... Yeah, the financial benefit is if you've got a happy and a good client, well, and they're playing good sport, mm. well, that's where from a from a you know, commission point of view, that's where you make your money. But it's a whole lot more than that. So yeah, you know, whether it's uh, helping them with their uni or whether it's helping them in job placements and that sort of thing is what we really do. Mm. Ha- typically, how many clients do you look at after at one time? Well, we've got as a business, we've got oh, well in the current. So it's we sort of our business is really current sports athletes, which is myself and James. Mm-hmm. So we do that. And then Chris and Megan do retired athletes, TV presenters, most of them. Like, say, you had Mark Philippus on. Mm-hmm. He's one of their clients. Um, Dermot Brereton's been a long-term client. Uh, Scotty Cam, Shana Blaze, these sort of people outside. Kane Corns, who keeps everyone busy. Corn. <laughs> the corn. <laughs> the corn. Um, but, like, there's, there's a real different variety of clients. Smurf Hughes, these sort of guys and girls that we look after. So... Um, that's the sort of the two parts of our business, but we'd look after mainly the predominantly the the current athletes. Uh, that's James and I, but we've also got a guys that yeah that we manage all through their footy careers. Gary Ablett and Jack Rewalt and guys like um, Dane Swan. So Swanee's still co- pretty hot in demand with a lot of things that he's doing. So yeah, we still look after those guys as well. Well, Gary Ablett, that's probably the biggest name. I'm like you would have had to do that whole deal going to the Gold Coast. That would have been a pretty big one for you guys. That was a big deal, yeah. It was, you know, it was a tricky deal because he was leaving Geelong, and you know, I was, I'm a Geelong man. Geelong man, yeah. <laughs> but it was just a really good opportunity for Gary. I mean, it was a brilliant opportunity for him, really. And when the, when it did present itself, he had he changed his mind about three or four times whether he'd go or stay, and in the end, he went. And he was fantastic for the Suns. I mean, they didn't get finals appearances. That's probably only because he did his shoulder that year that he was going to yeah. win the Brownlow by about ten votes. Um, but he loved it up there and then, of course, he found his way back to Geelong. Um, great client, great person. Uh, a bit elusive. He was elusive on the field. He's a bit elusive off the field. Yeah, you've got to work in to find him. But, <laughs> yeah, was, was uh, it, he wasn't one of those clients ringing you all the time? He, nah, nah. Gaz is nothing like that. No, yeah. no, no. But there, there are a number yeah. that do that, that yeah. you, know, that you speak to all the time. And, yeah, so over the years, like, we've had a lot of really big names, like Buddy Franklin's deal with Sydney was a massive deal at the time. Um, so that was that was another one. And, Another one, he was a bit elusive at the time, bud, but he's really got himself sorted now. So, look, that's the beauty of what, what we do, I guess. We get to meet a lot of people that you guys would love as sportsmen and, you know, and that's – for us, it's, you know, they're just clients. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we get on well, we like them all, but we just can't – we can't idolise these guys because at the end of the day, they're, they're sportsmen and, and, you know, we've got to do their best – you know, in their best interest. Like someone like Darcy Moore is in high demand at the moment. Um, so it's just working through what the right opportunities for him is. And he's smart enough to know what they will be. Mm. Yeah. And we're going to dive into all the aspects of play management shortly. But with someone like you mentioned, Gaz, and like using that as an example, he changes, you said he changed his mind three or four times throughout the year. From the moment he decides and set in stone, I'm, I want to go to the Gold Coast, how quickly after is that decision made pen to paper? Um, and then, and is it all secretive for a while? And like, who's the I'm, first person? I'm very good at secretive deals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I bet, I bet. I bet. Franklin and Everett, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at that stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, well, Gaza was tricky because that was the Suns were coming in, and you know they knew they were going to go after some marquee players, and it got out that he was he was their number one target, and it took a while, and he couldn't really sign until after the, the Geelong season had finished. So, whilst there was an agreement. You know, in the end, it could have been probably a verbal agreement, is it? Yeah, yeah verbal yeah. agreement. But what could have happened? In the end, he, is he, he could have backed out of it, but he didn't. Like, he pushed through and he was probably well, – Collingwood belted Geelong in the prelim that year in, in 2010. And then Gary, Gary was putting on a clinic on the ground. And that's to the stage where Swanny said, we're going to gather in the last quarter. We, 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 it's like we were just playing him. He, had about, he would have had about 50 touches. He had 40-something as it was anyway. And then Bob and Thompson moved him to the forward pocket because I think he knew he was going. So, and they were going to get beaten. So, uh, like, you got to – yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful with – what you can and can't say to people when it comes to these sort of deals because, you know, there's a lot of confidentiality in our industry. So we've mm. got to be really careful about who knows. What about when it comes to mental health with players? So I'm sure you, you're you on the phone with players. You mentioned some players call all the time, some don't. Now with today's modern day age with social media and whatnot, is, 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 is mental health like a key element and like mentorship as a manager? Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mentorship is something that we really like and that's why I love getting the young players because anything – Anything these young draftees are going, going to go through, I've been through. 
Mm. You know, move away from the country, you know, move out of home, come down to Melbourne, go wherever you go, traded, get drafted, have some success, have injuries, that sort of thing. So these are things that we think we're pretty well set up to be able to do, you know, be a mentor to young players. And then you've got the mental health thing. I think a good example was Tom Boyd. Mm. And Tom Boyd's a client of ours and Tom, we did that big deal to go to the, the Bulldogs and footy just wasn't doing it for him. And he speaks about it regularly. He's a fantastic public speaker and a very good person. And he, he it just, it just got to the stage where he wasn't enjoying it, and his mental health was suffering. So he walked away from two million dollars. He left two years at a million dollars on the table. Wow. Which he talks about. It's not like I'm saying something that I don't think people don't know. But mm. I mean, that's and that's a guy who's just helped Bulldogs win their first premiership in a hundred years or whatever it was, sixty years. Yeah, sixty-two. Yeah, yeah sixty-two. You're a Bulldogs fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Sorry, that was the greatest day of my life yeah. because and, and he, I thought he was fit not to be the Norm Smith medalist. Oh, he should have. Yeah. But he only had some back injuries, and then he wasn't really doing it for him. And it was pretty brave. He's only about twenty-three. Mm. He walked away from yeah. the game and walked away from a lot of money that a lot of people would have just played it all out. Just go to the club, go through the motions, cop your money, and then give it away but he didn't want to do that so i think that takes a lot of courage 100 percent. why didn't we see your face on the documentary that's been going out in the we don't light? do those documentaries <laughs> <laughs> was there an offer put to you yeah we do stuff that's something that we do yeah fair and enough so if you notice that tla and us are not involved yeah yeah they're the two that aren't involved well i was yeah. gonna ask like when when, when <laughs> <laughs> shut that down Rick, didn't <laughs> when, uh, when well i think it's a Maguire media production for a star we're oh, a competitor okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. and so would tla be yeah um when but come draft time, when you identify potential prospects that you know halfway through, let's say halfway through this season, or probably already do now, that they're going to make it, how do you what? How do you get a player to sign with you and not your competitors? How can you jostle for those positions? It's really, really tough. Yeah. Like footy's a really tough game. There are over 110 agents. I might even be 120 agents out there now. Now, wow. the majority of the players would be with 10, 15% of the agents. So the bigger companies, um, and we, we think we're one of those. Uh, we not, haven't got the numbers that TLA have got and Port Connors Group have got and all that sort of stuff, but um, it's 18 months out when you've got to sign them. Like, realistically, oh, really? you're not getting anyone. Unless a kid just comes out from under a rock this year and no one's seen him before, and then it is a scramble. Then you're up against every other good agent. And it's it's just a – it's a, in the end, it comes down to it. Do, they, do the kids think they can work with you? Do they like you? You know, because realistically, they don't know. Mm. But the young guys don't know whether we're good. We're saying we're good. I'm sure uh, Connors is saying he's good and Petroio at TLA, they're probably saying they're good and they, and they are. But it's a personal choice, you know, in the end. Um, we think we've got a great setup with the SEN behind us and we've got a footprint into all those big brands, which no one else has got. Like mm. We've got a million miles bigger than the rest of them as an overall company, but we don't have that division. We probably don't have that pressure. We've got pressure on us, don't worry, but... We don't have the pressure just to go out and sign 100 kids every year. Mm. We can pick and choose a little bit because we've got – we're part of a broader business. If you're just management, then you're dog at a dog at a bone with every kid in sure. the country. And there are a lot of kids, which is – a the scattergun attack, um, approach, I don't believe works because what happens is if you, you send a letter out to every kid that you think has got some ability, there are going to be a lot of disappointed kids. Mm. There's 50-odd draft picks. So true. So, and then yeah. you've got to pick up the pieces. So we have kids that don't get drafted and then you've got to go, what's the next step? Find them VFL. And that's a lot more work than the kid that gets drafted. So you've got to be a little bit wary about getting kids' hopes up for a start and then not being able to meet the expectations of you saying, oh, I think you're going to get drafted. Mm. And the other thing is, you know, when we say this from the get-go, we can't get you drafted. Oh, I can't get you drafted, mate. That's the reality. You have to get yourself drafted. I've heard I that get... before. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but that's the thing. I, I hear people say, if you come with us, you'll get drafted. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. How you get drafted is your performance. What we can do as a manager is we can say, right, not to be a coach because they're already getting enough coaching if they're in that junior pathway program. They're getting their yeah, school there's, coaches. There's a lot of coaches. A lot of people. Yeah. And then you've got a lot of these agents that come on you know, in the jump for five minutes and they're, they're trying to give coaching advice to these kids. It's like, what level did you play? You know, seriously. Mm. And they're already getting different coaching from their own coaches. So we just let it go. But we can give feedback from the people that count. And the people that really count are the recruiters. And after build, I've been I've been doing this twenty three years, so you build up a lot of trust with recruiting guys. It's like, all right, well, yeah, Dos, you, you know, how do you reckon he's going? Oh, he needs to work on his pace. He needs to work on his skill. <laughs> well, I don't know. No, nah, trust me, the skill is not there. <laughs> yeah. So you know, maybe a handball. Well, yeah. we think he needs to work harder. We think he's yeah. bludging a bit. Yeah. You know, we'd like to see him playing off halfback, which again, we don't have any control over where a player gets picked mm. or where he gets uh, played. But 
we can give advice, not just to the player, but to his family to say, look, this is what's coming from the people that are going to call his name out, potentially. So that's, I think, really valuable for young ones. This episode of the Dawson D Show is brought to you by Fleet Plan High Solutions. Now, when we say best in the business, we mean best in the business. I only think of one name. That's Fleet Plan High Solutions. When you think of Earth Moving, go straight to these guys at FBH because they are amazing. They pride themselves on projects big and small. But outside of that, it's their customer care that really makes them number one. If you want to know more, head to fbh.com.au. Now, let's get back into the episode with Liam. What about when it comes to brand deals? Like, How strong and how long in advance do you have well-established roots in relationships with certain brands because mm. I'm sure that's probably a key element of a, signing a player with a brand, whether it's Nike or Puma, whoever it is. Um, like if you're trying to get a big player deal, do you already have a pretty good enough idea that this bloke from that company will say yes? Yeah, um, yeah to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah, the big ones. Like, I mean, the young ones, it's getting harder and harder. Like when we were playing, we were getting paid all right to, to wear, you know, a certain brand. Like, what, what boot did you wear? I was out of that for most of my career and then I got a – got a deal with Feeler yeah. when they first came in and they were looking after Geelong and they Ronnie Joshua was, was my manager and he um, his clients all got you know, he did a deal Ron did a deal with David Carney who was the boss of Feeler who I ended up working for um, it's like you know I wasn't getting paid anything to wear out of that stuff I loved out of this and then uh, it's 15 grand to come and you happy to get 15 grand and wear Feeler boots <laughs> 15 grand yeah. it's about <laughs> 20% of myself of what they're paying me <laughs> so 100% I will throw away the copper Monday it was yeah. over the filler yeah, yeah. exactly right so yeah but, I mean I had a great relationship with Adidas at the time but yeah the, the Feeler brand at the time they were making a big play for it so now, those bigger players can yeah you, they pretty much can you know, command what really they want but not money wise because yeah. that money that was being paid back then is, is less getting paid now mm. like really? they've gone right away from the big, big you know the big contracts for big name players, I mean the, the the best players in the comp will be getting paid. They'll be getting paid well, but they're mm. not getting, you know, Roger Federer money. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's just it's just funny how it works. I mean, everyone think like Dusty Martin signed for with Puma for two hundred thousand. No, he didn't. Rare. Yeah. We well, just didn't. Yeah. It just didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, I, 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 well, it may have happened, but I, what I'm saying, <laughs> I'm knowing knowing our dealings with them, and that's just it. Yeah, that's just what gets speculated in the paper. Yeah. But that's how much they're paying him. And bonds are paying this. It's like, oh, maybe they are, but I doubt it, because you know, you know the market, and the market would say that Puma are going to stick, as an example, you know, hundred grand in to to, to uh, Dusty. Maybe they did, but it seems a lot of money. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, that was the sort of dough that Buddy Franklin was getting from Adidas. That sort of money. Yeah. So that was ten years ago. So well, it's when he was at Hawthorne, well, more than ten years ago. Like, but we hear so much about marketability. In the game, like and like that Bailey Smith's name gets mentioned a lot. The marketability for him to go yeah. to like a Geelong, like he's a cotton on ambas- ambassador, and like when when people when you hear that word getting thrown out, marketability is that meaning for the club or is that more or less meaning for him and his marketability? Well, he's got an enormous amount of marketability because he's a good-looking rooster, yeah, and he's a good player. Mm. He's a good player, but that'll that'll come for him anyway. I yeah. mean, he's just got that guy. He's got the huge following. <laughs> Yeah, look, which likes of Buddy and yeah, you know, all these other guys. The star players have all got Dacos and these guys. They've got brands coming at them all the yeah. time. So mm. you've just got to pick the right ones. Mm. How do you, how in the world do you manage relationships between clubs, especially like Trade Week, for example? Like how how can you on um, one day I'm using this as an example like Hawthorne are your best mates, and the next day they're not like because you're having to mold deals together and then. You need them for this and need them for that to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. How do you manage those relationships? Yeah, with respect in a lot of cases. You know, we've had huge blues over the years. <laughs> clubs. Oh, dude, there have been some shockers <laughs> over trades. <laughs> but you end up getting on with it because yeah. in the end, you'll end up with a player with the club. So there's no point burning your bridges with a certain club yep. just for the sake of it over one player because you do your best for the player. I mean, a good example of where lines get really muddied is, is Buddy. I keep going back to Bud, but Bud was... Hawthorne's best player, playing for Alistair Clarkson. So my client, playing for my client, Alistair Clarkson, going oh. to Sydney to my, one of my best mates and my client, John Longmire. Yeah. And Clarkson, Longmire and I were really good mates. So oh, that's got, that, that was a tricky one. And Clarko was great through the whole thing. I mean, he was a free agent, so he was a restricted free agent anyway. So, I mean, if the Hawks had I wanted to match the deal, they could have just matched it, but they didn't want to match the deal. So... Um, but in the end, after it all, when all the dust settled, Clarko came in and said, we'd, we'd have a chat. And we had a good hour and he, he asked me about how the deal went. And I told him, he said, this is what happened, this is what happened. I couldn't tell you, but he wouldn't let me tell you. He just said, don't tell him. So what could I do? 
So oh, that's so hard. Well, it is. Yeah. I mean, Bud didn't want to be put in an awkward position. The Hawks won the flag that year. Yeah. So you know, it, it was that was a, an awkward position, and I didn't like it at the time. But yeah, you know, I've got to represent business is business. the player. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so Clark, I said, oh, okay, you got to make a decision. You know, I think yeah, because this will happen again. You either manage coaches or you manage players. I said, I've got you and horse. I charge a bugger all, <laughs> and I got fifty clients, the AFL players. I'm going to clearly going to choose the players. So it was it. He goes, well, I'll, I'll do my own stuff. And then he ends up, he said, I'll find someone down the track. But Which is fine. But we're still good mates. There's no issues yeah. there. With, with the Buddy thing, like, and, and again, he's retired now. And I don't know how much you can say. But with the biggest name in the game was a, supposedly, wasn't he going to the Giants? Or wasn't they that big? Yeah, that caused a few issues between <laughs> me and the Giants, yes. Yeah. Can you talk yeah, us through that, that day? <laughs> Excuse me, that one I did. mean, yeah, I, I, I often think, thank God he didn't get the Giants because he would have played the Bulldogs in that 2016 prelim and they probably would have lost that if Buddy was there. But but isn't it rare, looking back, that like in this day and age that a deal would be done that blindsided everybody? Like, like yeah. that just doesn't... Most of the time now, when a trade's done, you're like, oh, well, we've known about that for six weeks. Like, it's rare that you... There's that shock factor anymore, but that was it, it was, yeah, well, I always say this, and I say it to Hutch as well. I said, the th- you were the best newsbreaker in the business and I was sat opposite you every week doing Saturday morning radio <laughs> and you never once picked together that he was going to Sydney. So I, 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 I was actually happy with that. Yeah, well played. Well yeah. done. <laughs> um, we never told the Giants. I mean, the Giants had it in their head that he was going to the Giants. I never once said he was going there. Mm-hmm. Never once. In fact, I never even tried to negotiate the initial offer. We should have told him something. So he said, here's the number. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, no worries. And then... I think what had happened is Leon Cameron and Buddy knew each other from Hawthorne. So they were talking to each other. Now, I don't know what Bud was saying to Leon, but I certainly never told Dave Matthews or Gabby Allen at the time, Steve Silvani. I never said he was going there. So when, when push came to shove and the deal had to be done, um, I was dealing specifically or exclusively really with Andrew Ireland in the finish um, and the, the Sydney team because Bud wanted to go to Sydney. At the end of the day, if he wanted to go to the Giants, we would have done a deal with the Giants. Yeah. But we, we wouldn't have just accepted their first offer. That wouldn't happen. So in the end, he preferred to play at the Swans and he's had a great time there. He's a great great player for them and they love him. And, yeah. you know, and he put bums on seats. And I think the AFL, although they were very, very angry at the time, over the top angry and they caused all, caused all sorts of dramas, you know, stopped Sydney trading and took away Cola and all that sort of stuff. The reality is he's been great for the game in Sydney. He just has. In New South Wales. I mean, he's, the, he's probably still the most recognisable footballer in the country yeah. right now even though he's retired during that time like how how often are you talking to bud like is it daily is it weekly is it during like, that during that season, that season yeah yeah that was a lot yeah a lot that year and how and how across it are you like you said you might have been talking to leon cameron no right? no i knew when he talked to it doing they'd be talking yeah, yeah i don't okay. know what they were talking about but yeah they were sort of friendly they were friends anyway really from okay. the hawthorne days when he was assistant coach at hawthorne but um, no, nah, that was all, all the way through. Because I did say this to Sydney in the early days because he'd sort of said, yeah, I'm in. Um, I mean, it was January, January of that year. And I just kept saying to, to Andrew and to Dean Moore and the guys at the, at the Swans, that there's a chance he'll, he'll, he'll pull the pin on this. Because I just I couldn't see him leave, leave, leaving Rough Ed and Lewis mm. and yeah. his mate. I thought he's going to get halfway through the year, Hawks are going well. He's going to say to me, oh, I'm out, mate. And they'd put a lot of time and effort and they were trying to work out what the deal was, how they're going to construct the deal and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I thought the, the issue might have been Buddy and it wasn't. He was just headstrong. Just that uh, was going to happen. He's going there, he's going there, but just don't say anything. So there was a very few amount of – well, hardly anyone that knew. Mm. Like, there's only myself and James that knew from my from our end. And then Bud told – well, his parents obviously and his girlfriend. Um, I don't think anyone else – I, from a Swans perspective, it was Richard Collis, because obviously he's the chairman, but the, all the stuff that we talked about was you can't tell the board. Richard's, you tell Richard, but if they tell the board, it's the, it's over. Yep. It just won't happen. If you really want him, Richard's got to not tell the rest of the board, which is a big thing for a chairman to do, which he did. Um, and there was Andrew Allen, the CEO, Dean Moore, the football manager, the doctor who had to do a medical on him, which was <laughs> the quickest <laughs> medical I've ever seen. The quickest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So just, Handshake, good to go. Just went like this a couple of times. Yeah, we could be <laughs> he, come in, he come in hot. <laughs> it wasn't the medical wasn't going to be the issue. I said yeah. afterwards that was a quick <laughs> medical, bud. <laughs> we very quick. Um, they wanted him desperately, and yeah, as I said, it went, went well. But it was a real needs to know basis, and yeah. um, 
And that's how it had to be. Otherwise, it would have got out. Yeah. Yeah, that's how things get out. Is you, you know, if you want to, yeah, when you, if something comes out of a footy club and something's gone on, it normally comes out, you see the media jump on it, and the good news breakers, Tommy Morris and Mitch Cleary and Dan Cherney and these guys, they're really good at their job. Um, what they do, and Sammy Edmund and these guys, what they do, I'll just think of the other SEN guys I better mention, <laughs> the news breakers. Uh, but those guys won't hear it from the player that something's happened. They'll hear it from a manager of another player because they'll just be talking to their manager going, oh, yeah, you know, D's, D's done his uh, D's done his knee. You know, you, you don't tell anyone. And then they'll be speaking to a club and I'll just, you didn't hear this from me, but, you know, D's done his knee, you know, this sort of thing. So that's sort of how these rumours get out, out of footy clubs and boards. And yeah. boards leak like sieves. Do, do boards leak a lot? So oh, that, that, see, that's something I always thought about, if that actually is true, because you do see rumours pop up of this has been said at the board. So that actually happens. Yeah, absolutely yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah, because, well, I mean, the really good journalists have great relations. Like Caroline Wilson's a great journalist, right? So she's got great relationships with key, key people at clubland, at board level and at the AFL. So, yeah, and she doesn't get everything right. And her and I have a lot of blues over the years about various things. But when you read some stuff about, especially high, high level mm-hmm. stuff, you think, yeah, there's going to be some truth around this because – She'll go to the source. And, yeah, as I said, there's a lot of speculation in our game. I mean, there's a lot of guessing. I mean, I read contract amounts about players that we manage. I'm thinking, oh, right, okay, he's getting paid that, is he? Yeah, oh, he's done four years at that, right, okay. Fair yeah. Enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's nowhere near it, but yeah. anyway, fair enough. Good well, guess. What happens when these journos are actually winging you trying to – like, do you even answer their calls? Or, like, how, how do you deal with that when they're obviously – I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm pretty well known as I don't return a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if, if, if I've got something to say, I will say it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's like during trade period. Like, trade radio is done out of our office. Mm. I walk past them every day <laughs> and they can't get us on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, we want, can you come on and talk about Josh Dunkley going to, you know, potentially going to Brisbane? No, nah, boys. Well, what am I going to tell you? The trade hasn't been done. I can't, there's no point me coming on and what, tell you that the trade might get done because you already know it might get done. Yeah. I'm not going to know until I know. So, yeah, I, I, I personally don't tend to get into all that. I don't deliberately be rude to journos. No. I think, yeah, they've got an important role in, in the in the industry, of course. But, um, yeah, if I've got – yeah, I, I dodge a lot of calls because I don't want to have that discussion Then because then you put yourself in a position where you're going to have to lie. And I'd rather not lie and just not get back to them. Yeah. You know, the, but sense. I've got strong relationships with a, with a number of them, obviously. So I'll work with a few of them. So it's not that I deliberately don't want to talk to them, but it sort of is. It must be an interesting office. Yeah, yeah, because it's just, it's it's like, you will ask me a question that I don't want to give you the answer to and I don't want to lie to you. Or I can't give you the answer and you'll probe me on it and then, you know, I'll either have to tell you a lie or I'll give you enough to say nothing there and you'll know that it's enough. Yeah, Yeah. that's enough for you to go with whatever you've got. Yeah. So that's where it's a little bit, a little bit tricky with the journo. What about if a journo says something about your player? Like, uh, uh, more often than not, or little at all, would you actually give them a buzz? Because the player might actually go, "Hey, pickers, they've said this." Does yeah. that happen? Um, like, can, can you actually give the, the journo buzz? Saying, oh, like, I have, yeah, I yeah. have in the past. I don't tend to these days because yeah. I don't. I don't What's see the point? The, I don't yeah. see the upside. I mean, yeah. it's already the damage is already done with half, yeah. the, you know, half the stuff they've written. Yeah, and so like all you do is try to you know, mitigate it then, and let the club go to town. Yeah, you know that's that's how I see it. I mean, it's you know as I said, they've got an important role to play, so I have no issues with that. Mm. But yeah, uh, I mean, there are times when you just want to grab the journal by the throat and rip his head off. But <laughs> yeah. what's that? What's the upside? You know, that's how I see it. Yeah. So what happens then? Because obviously you're in a a, a um, demographic of obviously a lot of young people, uh, men and women, and. Yes, As D, I'm a bit older. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, not, that's not what I was saying. I get it, I get it <laughs> That's not what I was saying. But, uh, yeah, God, now I feel terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trust me, I am old. <laughs> but I was going to say, when a player does stuff up and makes a mistake, whether it – I mean, obviously it happens because it, it, it's a reflection on society of a smaller portion. So if there is either drugs or alcohol or – Sex or whatever goes on and a rumour gets out and it does happen to be true, how do you, you use the word mitigate earlier, how do you either squash it before it, there's fuel to the flame and, and how do you actually coach the player through dealing with potential backlash? Yeah, we've had a few over the year. We've had a number over the years actually because I've been doing it so long. But uh, for a start, it's just it's always been with the guys that you think might be, just, just tell me first. 
Yeah. At least then we can work with the club. Yeah, you know, and then the famous one was Swanee back in the day where you know he nearly got sacked. Well, he did get sacked. The board's suggestion was to sack him and Neil Barr, myself, Billy Swanee's dad and, and Swanee sat in a room and then Mick Mulder saved him really. Um, back in the day, he'd been in a, some sort of an altercation at, at Fed Square. He was only a kid uh, and Mick went into bat for him. So, But that was Swanee, at least we knew what was going on. I mean, he told me, he rang me on the Sunday night. Those late night calls aren't much fun. <laughs> no, <laughs> you get a late night call. And it hasn't happened to me, honest, to be honest, for me for a while because um, now I'm – yeah, I'm 55 and, and James has been working with me since he was a kid. So he's in his mid-30s. They're more than likely going to go to pitch yeah, now because yeah. he's more their age group. Uh, the older ones will probably come to me. Um, but the older ones don't seem to put themselves – well, they don't get in those positions because they're mature. Um, and the young ones, you know, most of the kids coming in now are pretty good. Like mm, they're they're yeah. pretty good. Yeah, they're, 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 it's, they know it's a job. It's a, it's a big scene at the moment. Um, it's a big industry. So I think, in a general sense, I think they're ninety nine point nine percent really well behaved. Yeah, I mean, so there's the odd one that gets out of the, you know, there's the odd kid. Everyone's young when they're young, they, they make mistakes. But I think overall, I think you know, we you can highlight the the one or two poor examples, but the reality is, most of them are really good kids. So good the, young be, the best thing to do in that case is, for the, from a player's point of view, is pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I've, this is what's happened. The, there might be evidence of whatever's yeah. happened." And, yeah, so that's the best – rather than wait for you to pick up the paper. Or, well, no, yeah. no one's – you know, to be honest, it doesn't matter how low your profile is, you end up in a court. Yeah. People know about it. True, yeah. You can be in Sydney. It happened to one of our guys in Sydney a number of years ago. You know, it, same thing I didn't know and then I got a phone call the next day and, you know, he'd been caught at a pub with some stuff in his pocket or whatever. Um, you can't just hide that. The Waverley Court, even though he was, he was a relatively – Unknown player, or not not a well known player. But that, they they they've got a list of all the yeah. all the players' names, all the athletes' names. They can they can find them. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah, the best thing from a and we say this to them is if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Let's just work with it. Mm. So that's that's our advice to the young ones anyway. What about the media? I'm I'm going to go back maybe because what what was the show called? It was was it a Thursday? Was it was teams? it leading teams? Oh, uh, league teams. League teams. I, I I used to watch that every week. It was yeah. you and Parco and I loved it. It was a great chat. Yeah, was that on. good fun? Yeah, it was. I loved it. That was that was actually my favourite. I mean, I worked at Fox for six or seven years, and I did league teams all the time. Yeah. So it started with Clinton Grivers. Clinton Grivers. And then mm. it was BT, and then Brian went across to Seven, and I think can't think who the host was. That might have been Derm. Yeah, Derm was on there for a stage. Derm was was, was Lynchy on there at all? Lynch had been on it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was a Thursday night show, and it was before. I mean, you got so much access to the teams now. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's, true. You know, league teams, everyone. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, Super coach, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone, the, you guys would be more across who's in and out of the team than yeah, we would that's be. That's so true. But we enjoyed it, and Shorey was on it. Tony Shaw. Yeah, we right. had a, we had a, it was a great fun show. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was that was good. Grand Fox days were great. It, grand final edition out at Fed Square. Fed Square, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was unmissable yeah. when, like, yeah. as teenagers playing Super Coach, that was yeah, you needed. That was that, the show. You needed as much time as you could to to make your decisions. Yeah, and, and nowadays with the media, like, obviously enjoying your time on radio, and and do you have any aspirations to go back to TV or? No, <laughs> no, I don't. I, I love my time at Fox, but the last couple of years got a bit tough because it was all it's seven day a week. You know, management seven days a week as it is, and yeah. then. Doing Saturday morning radio and then I was doing Port Adelaide and someone on a Saturday night in Adelaide and then flying to the giant stadium. I always got the crap games. <laughs> like, I, mean, I, yeah. I travelled. And then so your whole week was travelling. It was just like, nah, it just wore me out. I mean, I was yeah. at that stage probably in my early 40s. Um, so it was just like, yeah, I just, I just worn, I was worn out with it. I don't know how Lynch is still doing it. Because Lynch is older than me. I think he's a year older. He's still going great. Still, he looks a lot younger. He's a good-looking wrestler. Oh, big <laughs> he's a very good-looking player. He's, he's a great man. One of the, one of the great <laughs> folks I've worked with, actually. Um, but, yeah, that crew, they were a good crew. Like, I love my time at Fox. Yeah. That's all I watch, to be honest. I don't watch anything but Fox. Cricket and footy. And what about your time with Hutchie? You, you, yeah. you, you're really good together. You're a good duo, you two, actually. You bounce off each other well. Well, we have been mates since... 1995. Wow. Yeah, yeah. so we he met we met 1995. He was a Cats fan. He, 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 oh, so he was fanboying you. Oh, of course he was. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, he did an article on me leading into the 95 Brownlow medal. That's and he he spun it in all sorts of direction, which he's doing. He's the king of spin. He spun king it in all of sorts spin. of direction, in, you know, whatever. But that's how we really met, and then we become sort of friendly, and then he become friends with my mates like Johnny Longmore and these guys, and all my Geelong mates. Next thing he's staying on. Brad Scholl and Lee Tudor's couch and 
you know, after a game. And then, and then he's saying, what? is he your mate? I thought he was your mate. You know, sort of thing. <laughs> so that's how he started. And then, you know, we were friendly. We worked together at Triple M when I first retired. Uh, we used to do Saturday night footy with um, uh, Jason Dunstall as well, um, which was good fun. And then he went his direction. I went to, to SEN. And, and then, um, yeah, I remember he said to me, he was working at AW and he got sacked from 3 w it's, it's a fascinating story, really. And he came and said, oh, you got, can we catch up for a beer? And I said, yeah, that's fine. So we catch up at my local. And he walks in and uh, I said, what's going on, mate? And he said, uh, that's, it. that's it, I'm never again. He said, what? He said, I'm never working for another boss again. I said, what do you mean? He goes, no. Nah. Because he, he, he wasn't the reason he got, they got sacked at AW, apparently. Anyway, I don't know the full story. But <laughs> he just said, no, nah, I'm done. Yeah. So he started Crook Media. Wow. He said, I'm going to start it with a, with a show on a Saturday mornings. Are you interested in doing a show on Saturday morning on SEN? I said, I'm already doing a show on SEN Saturday morning. I'm doing it with Mark Allen. There's no, not anymore. Mark goes out. I want to do a show with you because I've bought the airtime. I said, really? And he, I said, well, what's the show going to be about, Craig? As we're standing at the bar having a beer, he said, it's going to be about two blokes that, like we're standing at the bar having a beer. Can you do it? I said, yeah, I reckon I can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the show started. And that was... We don't know the exact date. We think 17 years ago. Uh, it's been going that long. Wow. We're going to run like the could have been the way we're going. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, it's, 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 it's just the show runs itself. And it started all sorts of like an hour here and then yeah. we were doing an hour in Tassie. Then we were doing it from the radio school in St Kilda Road and then we are in at SEN and then – anyway, we're like travelling Wilburys. But <laughs> he, he just saw a, <laughs> there's a, a niche market that wasn't being looked after, which yeah. was our market, which is country. Yeah. So I'm a country kid. He's a country kid. Yeah, we were when we were kids. We're a bit older now. But, um, <laughs> at but heart. Yeah, at, at heart. heart at heart, clearly. Yeah, yeah, still act like a child. But yeah, yeah so he wanted to, to take Melbourne to the bush. Yeah. Which is what, you know, yeah, what the SEN, before SEN, I should say, which was what Croc Media really wanted to do. So yeah. AFL Nation was really targeted and marketed, marketed to the country. And as I said, it was, it was a genius idea. And then whenever it was, a few years ago now, we bought SEN and, now it's a, it's a huge business. Yeah, it's massive. Should we jump to the first? Uh, <laughs> which which one's the first one? Oh, why don't we do golf box first? Okay. Golf yeah, box. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you told me about this golf yeah, box. What's this all about? Good, uh, well, you're you're, you're a good think, golfer, apparently. I'm so. not a good golfer. I'm a horrible golfer. I don't even actually play golf much, to be honest. In well, fact, I can't remember the last time I played. It's funny you mentioned Lynchy. And I'll oh, get yeah. Doss to explain that in a second. But before we do, what's in the golf box is brought to you by our good friends at Golf Box, Australia's greatest golf superstore. If you need it, they have it. And it gets to you fast and free. Shop online now at golfbox.com.au. Great they, brand, Golf Box. Very good, good brand. brand. Good Great brand. Yeah. Golf Box. Got to say it slowly. Golf Box. Golf, golf box. 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 Yeah, well, yeah. Lynchy's name got thrown up in the Golf Box segment. Did he? Last week or the week before? With uh, Lee Castle Dine. So Lee oh, is yeah, yeah. a former survivor, survivor and cricketer. cricketer. Yeah. And uh, actually, that was one thing. We, we talked a lot of cricket, which he liked, because no one knows him for cricket now. Oh. Everyone knows him for survivor. Oh, Lee. Yeah, he was yeah. a good cricketer. And uh, we talked a lot of cricket. And uh, he pulled out, which... Uh, uh, no, should, I, should we say what he pulled out? He pulled out, call the most famous person in your phone, right? Oh, right. That was um, a challenge. And he goes... He, he went on A, and he goes, Alistair Lynch? <laughs> and we're like... Up to you. Maybe we'll he, take it. <laughs> and Lynchy didn't answer. And we're like, are you sure you have Lynchy? <laughs> was, was it a bird dog? Oh, I hope I don't draw that one because nah. I wouldn't even know who to call. Nah. Buddy. <laughs> no, nah, we wouldn't make you do that. <laughs> Maybe you'd answer. <laughs> Where am I going here? Have a mix. All right. Let's have All a right. mix. What have you got? Pickers? <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst excuse you've used to get out of something? Here we go. Oh, here we go. Yeah. You, you would have used a few. <laughs> I have made a lot of excuses. I've been caught out a lot too. What's the worst excuse? Oh, I'm no good thinking on my feet. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is a tough. It is a, a tough. Trick, it's a tricky. Because um, oh, I think of I think of early morning meetings. Yeah. Like oh, or you know having to get up early to go to somewhere. Oh, you know a quick little excuse. I did use an excuse. So I missed out on an engagement party. I said I was in the state, and then I was busted in Melbourne, oh, which no. wasn't great. Oh. Yeah, I thought you were in a state. Oh no, no, you got canned at the last minute, sort of thing. So oh. that that did happen. Um, that'll probably be it for now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> well played, it. well played. But I'm sure I've used worse. Don't worry, I've used plenty of excuses <laughs> over the years. Well, because of course for for completing that segment, this is for you, oh. Golf Box. It's a two hundred fifty dollar. Oh. Golf box voucher. Well, I'll definitely you know, get friend. back into golf now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, go. absolutely. So I'll uh, show that to the cameras, Pickers, so uh, we can... Uh, Love it. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, $250 <laughs> golf box voucher coming your way. Thank you. Did, 
Do you get much time to like to do things like? Because you say you don't like golf. I know you love watching sport. I love sport. I like watching golf. Do you? I'm just yeah. not a very good player, and I've had a shoulder replacement too. So if I am, I'm a bit of a set of leg irons. If you go out and, play, and you got me on your team, and then obviously like, well, you've, I'm sure you like to spend time with the kids too. So any spare time you get, you probably spend with them. But what do you like doing outside, or is work life? You know, no, nah, it's all, no. I have a nice balance. <laughs> yeah, good. I have a nice balance. Don't worry. No, I just like hanging out with the friends and family, yeah. or whatever. It's, nice. it's it's good. I'm yeah, pretty social guy. Yeah, um, like getting away. Nice. Yeah, nice to have a little break. Mm. Went up to Broad Beach, which I go every year with my country mates. Nice. Yeah, it would get around the Magic Millions, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah. so I love the yeah. races. So I got yeah, all sorts of punning crews and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And yeah, there was a who's who up there at the Broadie Tavern, I can tell you. Oh, that. really? Every, really? Every afternoon, yeah. Wow, wait. Getting shouts with, you know. I was <laughs> the I've biggest done, name. Don't <laughs> name drop. Oh, just Ian Smith and oh, you oh, know. Wow. Billy, yeah, oh, J-Max over there, you know, talking to everyone. It was good. Really? That's that time of the year. So around wow. that. It's every second person in Melbourne's here, but... Yeah, no, I love getting away, but it's just hard in this industry. We only really get – what I normally tend to do is – so the footy season's full on, so I'm broadcasting every Saturday anyway. Our show goes 52 weeks of the year. Yeah. So Hutchie and I do off the bench 52 weeks. But we get a bit of a break from a work perspective. Well, we don't get a break. We're still working. But if you wanted to take a break, you take it post-trade period before draft. So you end of October, sort of middle of November before the draft all kicks okay. in. And that's a time I could normally take about 10 days, but last year I didn't go anywhere, um, which meant it dragged on a bit. Because once the draft's done, you're settling all the young ones in and you're sort of going and meeting clubs and all that sort of stuff. And then January is a it's a desert. Yeah. Like, it's seriously, it's, it's, there's thistles and all sorts of that. There's not a person in the <laughs> AFL working. No, there's not. But, it's, but it's still somehow close to the back page. Well, it's still going to make this back you page, know, you know, yeah. because, um, you know, you know, it is anything to do with AFL is going to sell papers. And it's going to, we're going to drive our station and, and all that may, that may be. But, yeah, it is really quiet because most of the recruiters, because they're flat strapped, they're, they're working similar to us. So you're basically, from the time they get back in January all the way to December, they're flat strapped because you've got rookie drafts and pre-season drafts and all sorts of stuff. So January is a time where you can actually have a break. So this was the first year because I didn't go away last year. I took a month. Came back on 22nd of January feeling so refreshed. Yeah, yeah. wow. So I'm going to probably try and do the same this year. Push through that October to you know, pre, pre-draft, post-trade period and get to the same thing so you can have a nice break where realistically nothing's been. Yeah, the players are away. Yeah. There's not much we can do at that time. I mean, cricket's on. That's the other thing. I have to do some, I'll do some cricket games. I try and knock as many as I can over before Christmas. And then so yeah, you're not biased at all, Piggers, by the way, when you commentate. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking the renegades. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's barracking or commentating. <laughs> but well, we love get, it. We love I get it. frustrated with the renegades because, you know, having such an involvement there for seven years and, you know, we walked out like George Costanza, we won the title and then the rest of the board got the ass, and uh, I'd already resigned, which was a bonus. But, I, yeah, you know, I, might, I won't get into it now, but... Yeah, I've got a very much a soft spot for the Renegades because it's been of an involvement. That's all. But and I want to see the Victorian teams do well. Yeah, and I of think course, they've done poorly for yeah. so long. So yeah, since have. BBL eight. Well, speaking of, and it's a good little segue. So Doss mentioned about getting away, but have you got any stories of? You know, we've heard about Hutchie's famous America trips. Have you have you been part of some of them, or even going back to the playing days, some uh, classic footy trip? Stories. Oh, you know the story with the footy trips. You don't talk about them much. <laughs> <laughs> but did We're, you go to the Super Bowl? Probably. No, I've never no. been. Oh, really? No, I've never yeah. been. I've been in New York with Hutchie plenty of times. We did, uh, and the footy trip ones were, oh, they were great. It's just debauchery, though. It's just yeah. every day. Where did you go? Where did you go though? So my now? trips were. This is this, is, this will sum up the, the, the how much money we were getting paid. So my <laughs> not fir- watertable. Yeah. You know? nah, well, not far off. Worse. I think the second year is worse. The first footy trip was. Perth. We went to Perth yep. and we went down the Margaret River and it was sort of like a footy. It was my first year. I didn't know what it was supposed to be doing. I know we were drinking a lot. The yeah. Margaret River, Perth. that's nice. And then we went down the Margaret River, but then they sent someone with us and we were like going for runs and all that sort of stuff. We'd like, <laughs> like do a gym and oh, what was going on? No, you don't do that on a footy trip. So that was 88. Then 89 was Johnny Longmire's farm at Corowa. <laughs> <laughs> when we went to the Baldale pub. We had no money north. There was 50 <laughs> blokes staying, staying in his wool shed. <laughs> like, seriously. Um, that was that was uh, and I, we went to well, like Gold Coast. Yeah, and classics. The big one was, so I reckon the next one was Hawaii, which was good. That was all north. And then... It's progressively getting yeah, further. Yeah. Oh, then, we go back the to, then we go to Hobart. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was my last year. I'd already been given the ass from north and I was on my way to Geelong, but they didn't know. And it was a bit of a tricky trip because everyone's going, oh, hope it works out for you. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to Geelong, mate. Let's play in the grand final. That's all right. Yeah. But I couldn't tell anyone because that stage hadn't been done. And then the Cats ones, we did... New, we did uh, 95. We did... 
LA, Vegas, wow. San Fran, and Mickey Mansfield got run over in LA. <laughs> 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 the, the goose stepped out of the hotel. And he, he looked right instead of looking Wrong left. way. <laughs> he walked and he went. We got the next day and they said, oh, we had a lot of calls from people back home saying, Mick's, Mick's been run over. Is he all right? <laughs> so he looked all right. <laughs> so, yeah, Mickey got run over and dope. Uh, and then it was just Bali. And yeah, we, went yeah. to, we went to the awesome my last, my, my last footy trip, which was really good. So Bali a couple of times. It was good. No, it was, they were great fun. And then the ones the American trips I've done with, with the boys has been fantastic. So... One trip we went, we we're in New York, and Hutchie just said, "Want to go to Boston for the for the World Series? <laughs> it's Game Six. I reckon they'll close it out. Yeah. They haven't won at home for eighty years." I said, "Yeah, why not? What are the tickets worth? Twelve hundred a ticket, but we can get them." All right. So we got on a train. There was him and I, Damien Barrett, a uh, couple of my well, bloke from the AFL, Birchie, uh, guy, one of the McDonald's you know, guys, a uh, couple of other people. And we sat on the train. I don't know how long the train trip was, but they were out of grog by the time we got there. <laughs> like, seriously, we were just near the bar. Yeah. So we get there, throw our stuff in at the hotel, straight to Fenway Fenway Park, and it was unreal. It was an yeah. old, an old, and we watched the we watched the Red Sox win the World Series. Wow! And it, it, it was nuts afterwards. But what was funny was one of the guys with us. I won't no, say who it was. It wasn't Hutchie and I or well, Damo. Is with us. Paid twelve hundred a ticket. The fourth innings, he's no, oh, no. He's, mate, the people around were going nuts, oh. going nuts at him. All these Boston well, it's fans, disrespectful, probably to them. That's what they were saying. And he was sound asleep. He slept for three innings. <laughs> Seriously, three innings, and then disappeared. And then we saw him back at the hotel afterwards. Oh, people, people were going nuts. We had twelve hundred for a ticket, and he saw yeah. three innings. He bagged the pregame. So it was terrible. The dropkick Murphys or whatever. Dropkick Murphys. <laughs> yeah. and then we, so then we leave the stadium, and it was mayhem. All the yeah. uni students were coming down, all the college students. Oh, yeah. And they were hanging off poles, and we were sort of going out between them. We had our driver. We had like a cab driver or an Uber driver or something picking us up up the road to take us back to our hotel to get out of – because it was just out of control. But it was it was a great experience. I loved every minute of it. It was fantastic. So did Hachi live over there for a period of time? Oh, he had a residence there. Okay, he was yeah. sort of yeah, in, the, in the West Village, yeah, in yeah, Greenwich, nice. Greenwich. But he, uh, he had a little apartment there. Yeah, nice. He's just – him and another bloke are just six months apart, you know, yeah. when he'd go over and then the other bloke would – Come back to Australia, where it was. I didn't even know the other guy, but um, I want to couldn't swing a cat in the joint. <laughs> I would have stayed there, that's for sure. <laughs> it's it, pretty small. When, when it comes to uh, when you, I guess, started management, and then obviously you built Precision. Do you remember like early days it being difficult, like real challenging building a business, like from an entrepreneur point of view? Have you got some maybe advice or some? It's not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not really. We took the place. IMG closed the division, yeah. so we yeah. that was the the build was already there. Yeah, and you had closed. foundation. So yeah. basically, just yeah. closed up shop. We just took the place. Yeah, we were already doing it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not an entrepreneur at all. No. Like, I'm just not that guy. Like, I'm a nuts Let's and clip that up. I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I'm not the, I haven't got the creative juices that some of the others have got, but I can, yeah, I can get into a room and negotiate, I guess, and that's one thing I can do. Negotiate. Have you got, I don't know, This you, it might just be a flat no, but have you ever done a deal that there's been a strange, like, inclusion? Like, the players like, look, I'll go to this club or I'll sign this deal if I get... X, I don't know if it's cars or clothes or, or something, just something really bizarre. Has that ever happened or no? Not really. The, num- well, the that number well. they want, the number on their back, is that part of the oh, deal? Oh, the, it was the buddy one. Yeah, yeah 23. So the, the buddy one was when we were negotiating, um, I said to the boys, well, yeah, so we'd, we've agreed on the numbers, which was everyone knows what the number is. We agreed on the number for Bud, as in what he was getting paid, <laughs> what he was getting paid, not what his actual number was. And then... We're chatting away and I said to the CEO, I said, oh, um, and the footy manager said, well, clearly he's going to wear number 23. That he's, He is number 23. I said, yeah, yeah, well, we'll sort that out. We'll sort that out. We go in. So it finally gets ticked off by the AFL. We go in for his first press conference as a Swans player because it took, th- I think, a week and a half or something before they ticked it all off because the AFL were that filthy about it. God, they were filthy. So they tried to? Oh, they tried everything. Really? So they, they tried it, to they, stop it from happening, did oh, they? Yeah. Wow. They, they, they tried. Well, they did everything from... They made every board member on that board at the time sign a letter to say that um, his money will stay in their salary cap regardless of whether he retires and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that dragged on for days because there were blokes overseas and trying to get on to people to get them to sign these letters and waivers and all sorts of stuff. It was completely over the top. Anyway, uh, so we're sitting in the room. <coughs> excuse me. We're sitting in the room and me, Buddy, Johnny Longmire, footy manager, head of marketing and the CEO. 
and we're chatting about the questions that might come. So John Mosso is giving him the old, you know, blah blah blah. You know, they'll ask you about this, and it's just going to be horse and horse and buddy sitting up there. You know, like Jackie sitting there answering <laughs> questions. Cameras everywhere, media everywhere at the front of the swans. Anyway, and someone said, "What happens if what happens if it comes up about the number about number twenty three? Horse goes, hey, we got a player in number twenty three, and I said, mate, it's part of the deal. I said, hang on, I haven't spoken to young Lockyer, oh. Jordan Lockyer, about it. Oh, the poor bugger. And he said, so let's not bring it up. And Andrew Island's <laughs> sitting over at the back and he's gone, hey, John. And Andrew's an unbelievable person, but also a great CEO and a good good operator. He just said, John, marketing, I've got 100 number 23s upstairs. I'm pretty sure they're not for Jordan Lockyer. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Anyway, so, so we agreed in the room. That, you know, if they ask about the number, you'll say, oh, we'll just wait and see. Anyway, they said to him, <coughs> excuse me, so, buddy, are you going to wear number 23? Absolutely I am. <laughs> I see Horse look at him. I said, what about the young boy? Oh, he'll be right. Well, he'll, he'll be okay, I'm sure. <laughs> and he just moved on to the next question. I saw anyway, afterwards, I said, really, do you have to say that, bud? He's gone, oh, what's well, going to happen, isn't it? I said, yeah, he is. <laughs> Fair enough. kid doesn't know that he's, he's gone from number 23 to number 48, yeah, which yeah. he's about oh, to. The poor bugger. Yeah, oh. Anyway, the poor bugger. It wasn't his fault. But, yeah, so that was <laughs> so unlucky, that wasn't a yeah. special request. That was just something that came up yeah. in discussion. But, no, nah, the majority of the, of the deals you do are they're pretty black and white, really. They're yeah. just... Pretty vanilla. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like clauses you put in for best and fairest all Australia. Yeah. Brownlow. I don't even, we hardly ever put a Brownlow clause in, to be honest. Really? Yeah. You know, it's, it's an individual award. If you win the Brownlow, you're going to make a lot more money than whatever they can put in there. So, mm. yeah. Well, the Cats got Geelong took, they had, they took the all Australian bonus. So, no Geelong player can get an all Australian bonus now. Oh, really? No, Brian Cook took it out. They remember they had nine or ten all Australians <laughs> yeah, in one yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> their salary cap. <laughs> yeah, so I went, they went completely out of the yeah, so so I went oh. in. Try, I went in to try and I think to try and get a yeah you know, all Australian bonus for Chappie or you know, Paul Chapman or James Kelly or someone back in the day. <laughs> That's over. No more of that. <laughs> yeah, this is what cost us last year. I said, right, I fair enough. So, so they you actually have to allocate and in, in the event that X amount of players. You could could you actually tip over the salary cap oh, well, based on? Yeah, I, that, that was his point. I think they yeah. would have been able to be able to go yeah, through it. To be honest, yeah. I mean that's all forecasting, but no one's forecasting ten all Australians, are they? No, so, no, true. <laughs> true. But that was that. It just happened to be that year. Should we jump to the virtual expo? Yeah, absolutely. I'll get. Oh, what's this next one? All right. So this one's going to be a little bit different. We just said uh, we'd like to we like to um, make this for each guest <laughs> relevant. So yep. do, do you want to read that out? Yeah, go for it. Uh, this segment is brought to you by our good friends at the Virtual Expo. If you want eyes on your business, this is the place to be. And all you need is an internet connection. Visit www.theexpo.com.au to get involved today. We will explain a little bit further what that means shortly. But your job is very easy, Pickers. Is it? So being the player manager, we're going to do a bit of a buy-sell trade. Ooh. Is that right? Yep. Mm. So we've got three names here. Yep. And I want you to buy one. I want you to sell one. I yep. want you to trade one. And give us a little bit of the reason why. Yep. So, But they're not players, are they? They're not players. Well... One of them played once okay. upon a time, yeah. but um, these are more media personalities. Yeah, okay. and I think you know them all pretty well. So the first one's Hutchie. The second one is Damien Barrett. Yeah. And the third one's Billy Brownless. <laughs> so I need you to buy one. I need you to sell one. And I need you to trade one. And we also need the reason why. Uh, oh, so it was Damo, Hutchie and Billy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can interpret that. On whatever landscape you want. Okay. It, it could be good bloke. It could be work. It could be whatever. They're all good blokes. Let me okay. put that on the table. Yep. They're all good mates of mine. Uh, <laughs> I'll buy Hutchie, surprisingly, <laughs> because he likes to buy everything else. That's <laughs> actually, a very no, good point. Actually, no, I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll change that. I'll sell Hutchie because okay. he's a great salesman. So yep. he, he can be sold. I'll sell the big man first. <laughs> He'll sort himself out. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll buy Bill because... He likes to buy beers, and yeah. I like to drink beers with him. So, and he's a good shouter. Yeah. So, I'll buy Bill, and I'll trade Damo. <laughs> he's just a bit purple. <laughs> he's, just he's, a bit purple. he's a bit purple, <laughs> but he's he's a ripping bloke. No, so, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go that way. I'll buy Bill. I'll sell Hutch. I'll trade day, mate. Well, yeah, thank like you, because we, we <laughs> like that very much. Our good friends at the Virtual Expo are supplying you or a friend or somebody you'd like to give this to an, a booth at the upcoming Virtual Expo. So what it is, it's – have you been to like a trade exhibition before I for have. businesses? Yeah. So imagine like the Melbourne Showgrounds. It's all decked out and all the businesses have uh, uh, got their own stalls. This is all online. So the exact same premise, speakers – 
interactive workshops and hundreds of businesses on one on two big days yep. and you can just come through you can request live meetings live networking and of course uh yeah buy sell connect yeah, that's the one, so that's it, it. so we'll, good we'll, job we will uh we'll get our people to talk to your people and organize that but i'm just interested before we let you go billy brownless and yourself we just mentioned him you have a bit of a Worn words sometimes across the radio. <laughs> sometimes he lets things slip that I'm not sure you might be happy with, and maybe works vice versa. What, what's the? How does that That's all work? Just ex teammates. Yeah, it's just ex teammates. Because he always does this. As a go up my nose, so he does that all the time, and I'm always doing this one. Yeah, he's yeah, so fat. Yeah. <laughs> but we have a we have a we're, no, we're good mates. Yeah, he's a fa- he's a funny man, and we have these cats catch ups. Yeah, at least a couple of years with our sort of group and the older boys. Uh, and usually at you know, his pub in Geelong, the Cremorne, or we do one in Melbourne. We the Mel- what, Geelong ones are hard to get to because you've got to get an Uber there and an Uber back or whatever. But the Melbourne ones, we always get together because uh, Billy's in Melbourne just as much as he is in Geelong. In fact, he probably spends more time in Melbourne. So uh, if you ever want to find Bill, just go to the Botanical Hotel. You'll see him there most <laughs> nights. <laughs> He's performing most nights there. <laughs> performing. <laughs> but, yeah, no, no we, we have this ongoing Triple M and – and SEN sort of stuff because we sit right next to each other in the box. Yeah. yeah. So we're commentating the same day and there's a glass panel between fat and off. <laughs> yeah. So he's putting notes up against the wall, him and Bracer are in there. And I, can, I hear him all yahoo and I know he's going, <laughs> <laughs> I know he's doing that. <laughs> do, do, do you actually, because you obviously sit next to them, we, don't, we obviously hear it on the radio, we don't see it, but who is someone that you say just gets too excited? In commentary? Commentary. Oh, we got a lot. That's a good one. Depends. Andy Ma when Carlton are playing. Oh, that was great. <laughs> I love that. Hutto when Geelong are playing. Really? Oh, Hutto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He really gets into it. Bruce Eva when St Kilda are playing. Oh. Yeah, real, uh, real, Who was real that Saints one? man. Sorry? Beaver. Bruce oh, Eva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, real, uh, real Saints man. Uh, Johnny Donahoe just because he's excitable. Yeah. And I call the cricket with him and he gets really excited. Um, <laughs> he's one of our young broadcasters at SCN. He does footy and cricket. Um, but they're all good. Yeah. I mean, I... I, I'm I'm surprised I'm not surprised I'm I'm staggered at how good the level of broadcasting is. Mm. SEN is stacked. In, with, yeah, we yeah. are. We've got a great team, but yeah. I think most of them have got great teams. Yeah. By the way, how was the 20 year uh, catch up? That, that sounded good. great. It yeah. was fun, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it was at the Sporting Globe in Richmond. It was all our listeners and. You know, you, you you guys listen to the station. You know, you've got Trout from Woodend and you've got – so you don't know what they look like. Yeah. <laughs> but they come up and they say, oh, I'm, I'm, so, oh, I'm, I'm Bill from Berwick. Oh, okay, Bill. <laughs> and so it was good. I spent a couple of hours there and um, Gary, Gary turned up, Gary Lyon and uh, Jared Healy, I should say, and uh, who else was there? Miles was there. Anyway, there was a crew, crew of us that went along. I, I must say one man who I know was super – Enthused and excited about this milestone was the bloke next to me, but for one man and one man only, which was Mr. Mark Fine. <laughs> oh, fine. He, he yeah. loves him. Oh, oh yeah. I, that that was when he had his show. I used to. So oh, this is an annoying backstory to give you, Pickens. But so we grew up in Mornington. Yeah. Like I told you, my first girlfriend. She lived in Melton, right? So it was a, a bit f- of a trek. Fair hike, right? <laughs> and you be, the, very keen. You've got to be keen. <laughs> yeah. I'm not making any more comments on that. But uh, I was freshly 18 and you do what you do for... Of course. Back when, in those days. When you're 18. Of, yeah, yeah. To get your, you travel. Like, yeah, you travel. You <laughs> Put travel. the white shorts yeah, on, mate. Petrol. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but uh, so the, obviously late nights because you'd, you'd go up, you'd uh, spend a couple of hours, you'd give a couple of your best hours and you'd, you'd travel back down and you'd be doing, you know, late night. And, you know, kept me company during you've those... Been, you've been a bit generous, are you? Really, a couple of hours? <laughs> couple of hours. <laughs> that, that, inclu- that, 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 that includes... That includes... That includes eating and, and watching a movie and saying hello to the pets and that includes everything. And then the last five minutes, yeah, I'm off. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> right. Generous. Oh, well, it's getting late. Um, but, yeah, the drive down would always be accompanied by Finey and I used to just absolutely piss myself laughing That's and I'm, I'm... Yeah, I'm pumped he's back. Yeah, we yeah, too. I mean, Hutchie's, to be honest, he's been trying to get him back for a couple of years. So I've finally been able to work it out because he's got his own business he's running now and it's going well. And now nah, everyone loves, loves fine. He's just different. I hope he's the same as he was. You know, I hope he is as reverent as, as he can be because, you know, you, you'd get people that are half pissed that are ringing up after a match, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and venting and abusing and he'd cop them and he'd give it back. And, and that's what everyone liked about it because yeah. um, there'd be a lot of people tuning in. He's got a real following on SEN. Oh, yeah. I see the messages every week when we're doing our show. Really? Bring Finey back, bring Finey back, bring Finey. Really? Get Hutchie to bring Finey back. Get, yeah, get Hutchie to bring Finey back. You know, that sort of stuff goes on all day. But, um, 
Yeah, well, so it's so about, unique. It's not you don't get that anywhere else. Because there's not too many people who are that brave to be able to actually have their opinion and say yeah. it the way he does. Yeah, he does. Yeah. You know, and he, he gets a bit loose at times, but <laughs> You That's know, what we love, though. Stephen Buddy Curry. <laughs> a break and when we get back. Another break. <laughs> yeah, we love him. No, so it's going to be good. It'll be fun when he gets back. Uh, well, Pickers, mate, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We've had a, a ball. We're grateful for your time and uh, yeah. Yeah, you've shared some rippers, so we appreciate it. Thanks, Doss. Good on your date. Thank you. Good Pickers. to chat, boys, and uh, good luck with the show. Thanks, appreciate mate. it.